Note, I just started recording this so that everyone will get the benefit, even if they're not here, will get the benefit of the response. So generally, when are assignments due? General for me is the assignments I like to have turned in by midnight the day before class. Basic, and again, I'm flexible on this. The reason I like them due about 12 hours before class is because I like to have the morning, like what I did this morning, was look at your responses to the assignment of please attach a document that shows a representation of DNA. I like to be able to look over those before I come to class. So if it was due at 10.59 in the morning today, everyone would turn it in at 11.05 or 10.59 or 10.58, and I wouldn't have time to review all of your work, which I did today. I won't always, but I looked at everything that all of you submitted, and we're going to go over those, some of those uh, during class today, some of the images that you submitted through that Google Classroom activity. So in general, Watching movies, watching textbooks, you just have to do before you come sit down here in class for that class session. And assignments usually do 11.59 p.m. the night before. Other questions? Again, a lot of the Google Classroom assignments, the Socrative exercises that we're going to do at the starts and the ends of class, some of those will be graded, some not especially the Google document and Google Classroom assignments for this first week or two of the semester when we're still all practicing the workflows with their tablets, annotating PDFs, attaching them to the Google Classroom, submitting it. These are no stakes. This is just practice. I want you to turn them in so that you get feedback on whether or not you're understanding how to do this process. Again, because once we get to exams, it's going to be exactly the same process, and I don't want that process to be stressful for you. You're already stressed out enough about the exam. We don't need to add technology on top of it. So let's take a look at some of the quiz answers. How would you describe, or how would you know, if you can see this, whether the two strains of DNA in a double helix are anti-parallel? Here are, some, here are some of your responses. One of the strands go from 5 prime to 3 prime, while the other goes from 3 prime to 5 prime. Purines on one strand will connect with primidines on the other strand. Does anybody see any? If you can read this, does anybody see up anything up here that they don't agree with? So the <clears throat> so are hydrogen bonds important in determining anti-parallel structure? Not as much. We could be the number of bonds that are in the, um, the amino acids. There's three bonds, I think, for the uh, cytosine and three bonds for the guanine. Yep. So two, three hydrogen bonds between cytosines and guanines, and two between adenosines and thymines. Oops. Ha. Nobody gets extra credit points if they catch me making a mistake, but do point it out if I ever do. So there's. <laughs> and also, when I do that, throw something at me. There we go. So now you can actually see what I'm projecting. So here are two DNA strands. This top molecule, ACGTC, is one strand of DNA. The bottom strand is a second strand. Are they anti-parallel? The hydrogen bonding is showing as the vertical lines in between the four different letters, the nucleotides. Right, so by, what do I mean by anti-parallel DNA polarity? So it's something about five prime and three prime carbons, which maybe starts making people have nightmares and bad memories of previous classes. But in this case, the definition of anti-parallel structure 
is that the five prime carbon is at one end of a DNA strand, and a three prime carbon is always at the other end of the same strand. So in blue here, that's one strand. It's definitely going to have a five prime carbon at one end and a three prime carbon at the other. So the question about anti-parallel structure is what? Where are the carbons uh, located? Where are the three prime and five carbons located? Right, on the bottom strand. So if this is anti-parallel, which carbon is here? This is three prime. And that makes the five prime carbon, right? The end of each DNA strand is always going to have a five prime carbon at one end and a three prime at the other. We'll go into more details in a little while. In fact, one of the movies I'm going to ask you to watch for next class has to do with this prime carbon business. So hopefully that will clarify things. So anti-parallel means that when you look at two nucleotides that are base paired with each other, the carbons don't match. There's a five prime next to a three prime. That's an anti-parallel DNA structure. That's how double-stranded double -stranded DNA is normally found in nature, anti-parallel. Any questions about that? We're going to go to this in more detail, but if there's any really important questions that you want to ask, that's fine. Plenty of time for your questions. Again, this is your expensive time where you're paying money to get help from me. So. Yeah. Are we going to go over the whole thing? Yes, we will. Yeah. Depending on how long I make these introductory activities, sometimes we won't go through all the answers, but I figured today in class we might as well. So that was the first question. Anti-parallel, you look at the, the carbons and their numbering. And let's check out the next question. Which carbon, which atom is attached to the three prime carbon of the ribose sugar in a nucleotide? This is not, by the way, representative of exam questions because I don't usually ask factual exam questions. I'll probably add a few to every exam, get you going. Oh, good, he's asking multiple choice questions. And then get you into the exam and then maybe make the questions more difficult. But let's see. Mixed bag. The vast majority, well, a majority, vote phosphate, then oxygen, then hydrogen, then nitrogen. Three prime carbon. All right, I guess that means I have to actually draw out the sugar molecule, which again, not again, I haven't told you this yet, you don't have to memorize organic structures. So I will not ask you to draw a ribose sugar on an exam. So ribose is a five-ring sugar. So we've got oxygen. What's the prerequisite for this class? Co-requisite? You have to be taking organic chemistry right now. OK, good. So we, for those of you that don't remember or haven't learned yet, in an organic molecule, when we don't show what atom it is, it's a carbon. Okay. Let's see. I must have missed something because there are five, at least five carbons, because there's the one prime, two prime, three prime, four prime, five prime. I've only drawn four carbons so far. Uh, five carbons. There we go. So there's a carbon right there. So outside of the ring, there's a carbon sticking up. And there's a phosphate there. And these carbons are numbered five prime, four prime, three prime, two prime, and one prime. There you go. So what else haven't I drawn in that's important? The OH. So that was one of the options. I gave you options of what were the, let's see, phosphate, oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen. So some of those are misleading. So the five prime is connected to a phosphate. Three prime is connected to an oxygen. And when this is a nucleotide that's not part of a DNA molecule, that's a hydroxyl group. OH. That's just sugar, phosphate, and oxygen. Where's the bit that actually makes the hydrogen bonds? 
Yeah, it's connected here to the one prime carbon. So that's the nitrogenous base, except not with an M, with an N. Those are the parts of the chemical structure that tell you if it's an A, a T, a G, or a C. Adenine, guanine, thymine, cytosine. Okay. So five prime carbon connected to a phosphate. This makes me think about that comedy genius thing. If you wanted to record, you know the head bones connected to the neck bone song thing? If you five prime carbons connected to the phosphate, and you could make up a funny song, you do a dance, and record it, and play it for us, and you'd get some points. Or not. Okay, so five prime carbon is connected to phosphate. Please do, yes. Ah, okay, so this is a good next question. So if we zoom that out a little bit, there's one free nucleotide. It hasn't been incorporated into a DNA molecule yet. It's just floating around inside the nucleus. What does this look like when this is connected to another nucleotide? So here are two ribose sugars and their carbons. So how do they get connected to each other? So there's an oxygen here. Hmm? You have to get rid of the hydroxide? Hydroxyl? Right. So that oxygen will get bound to the phosphate that's connected to the next nucleotide. And that makes... Just get rid of the hydrogen. You get rid of the hydrogen. And this is an organic reaction that you'll talk about probably at some point, either in organic chemistry or in biochemistry, or both, more likely. And that's why, oh, by the way, I haven't quite drawn this correctly. There's also an oxygen in between each phosphate and the carbon. That's why, and the reason I know that is because I have this word from long ago that rings in my head, phosphodiester backbone. What does that mean? So anytime you have, anytime you have a something oxygen something carbon oxygen carbon or carbon oxygen phosphate bond, that's an ester bond. So there's a diester bond. Phosphate is linked in both directions to oxygens and beyond them to carbons. So two ester bonds, diester, including a phospho. So phospho diester bond. That's what links the ribose sugars together. So the backbone of DNA is comprised of phosphates, oxygens, and carbons. And I'm just circling it in black here. So that's the backbone. That's what makes the strand of DNA. It's a linear string of carbons, phosphates, and oxygens all linked together down the entire strand of DNA. And then the bases come off here. And those are the parts that base pair with two or three hydrogen bonds to the other strand of DNA. This is a great place to start class. Is anybody afraid? No, I shouldn't use the word afraid. Is anyone afraid of me yet? <laughs> Let me start over. In past semesters, I've done what every scientist probably should do and follow the order of chapters in the textbook. And in my five years or so being an instructor here anyway, it seems like students always freak out a little bit when I skip chapters and just move around the book somewhat randomly. So I'm here to tell you that it's not random. Even though we're, not, even though we're using free textbooks, I'm still picking and choosing. There's a method to the way we're going to proceed through class. Normally, genetics classes start with what? What topic? <clears throat> I'm starting with the structure of DNA, but, and you don't know this, but a lot of genetics textbooks start with the P. Yeah, you could have said that, right? 
you were thinking of it, you did say it. A lot of genetics textbooks start with Mendel and traits and phenotypes, things that we all have observed before, and it's kind of chronological. And that's when you start getting professors testing you about Bates and scientists and what experiment did they do and when was Van Leeuwen and all that sort of stuff. But I don't do things in chronological order. I do things, as you're suggesting, from the molecular to the large scale. So we start with, what does DNA look like? What are the atoms? What are the molecules? We build up in scale from there until we get to about <coughs> the previous semester, Mendel, and how DNA controls traits. Then we can have a more informed discussion about what the hell does the DNA do to control a trait anyway. So I hope that this structure of class is more useful to you in learning about DNA and how it controls traits. Other questions? Please. Behind you. Yep. And then. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, yes, the question was three prime. I did write that, didn't I? Yes, so three prime carbon is connected to? Oxygen. Oxygen, so. Is it simply oxygen? The three prime carbon is connected to an oxygen. Yes. Sorry. So now I'm being the horrible, confusing instructor who said one thing and then changes his mind. But you're absolutely right. I forgot which prime carbon I had asked about in the quiz. Five prime phosphate, three prime oxygen. So here, three prime carbon of the ribose sugar, oxygen. Thank you for helping us clarify that. And now, sir. Oh, fantastic. You've been collaborating? Even better. I don't think that's a genetic trait, though. All right, let's see. One last question. Oh, let's see. N nucleotides and RNA molecules form hydrogen bonds with other molecules, with other nucleotides. It's true. Why is it true? Those of you that answered true. Or you just had a 50-50 chance and... I chose it because of all uh, of polarity. Um, I want to assume that the bulk of the electrons are stripped from high pairs. And they're allowed uh, for the attraction of the side. So we, RNA looks very much like DNA. You're going to see this again for next class. We're ahead a little bit, which is totally fine. Letting the conversation be a bit organic. Wah, wah. But see? Science in action. Comedy genius standing up here. So it does have to do with electrons. RNA is a single-stranded, normally, molecule. It's got a backbone, like we just discussed. And then it's got nucleotides. I'm just going to abbreviate NT, nucleotide, 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 with electrons hanging out here. You're still on the slide. Thank you. I promise. This gets better with time. So, we've got a single strand of DNA, that's RNA, nucleic acid, with their nucleotides, but they're not hydrogen bonding with anything. Here's the five prime end of a molecule, here's the three prime end of that RNA, ribonucleic acid molecule. It doesn't normally base pair. Normally, we find DNA in a double helix. Anti parallel, everything is base paired. Like this. Five prime end, three prime end, five prime end, three prime end. All of the nucleotides are base paired together. That's DNA. RNA doesn't normally look like that, but some RNA molecules do, and we'll learn about this as we go through the term. How would an RNA mo molecule base pair? Has to be anti parallel, too. Okay, turn to a neighbor for one minute and Talk, discuss with them. See if you can convince somebody that you can draw, come up with a structure for how RNA might base pair with another RNA molecule. Then we'll talk. One minute. Go.
Okay, let's come back together. Ah, see, another good catch. Those should be, if I'm drawing RNA, these will be uracils, not thymines. Okay, who's got a solution to our problem? Potential solution, who's got a guess? How can an RNA molecule base pair with another RNA molecule? With another RNA molecule? Well, it doesn't matter. It can base pair with itself, like right there, you have a pair can sequence essentially the five thymines A, uh, base pair with the three thymines U, and then another UA base pair, and then a GC base pair with a four nucleotide U, essentially. Okay, so let me try to, I'm glad you saw where I was going with that. Let me see if I can interpret in drawing. So here's a single-stranded RNA molecule. And the term hairpin was just bandied about. So let me redraw this in a different fashion. Am I actually displaying this? Okay, good. So here's the five prime N. So let's write out, say the letters for me in order. All together now. Cool. So, where do you see opportunities for base pairing? So RNA molecules are single-stranded by nature. They're produced as single-stranded molecules. We talk about that when we get to transcription. But they can base pair with themselves in short <laughs> stretches. Up here, these U's don't base pair with anything. Their two hydrogen bonds are sort of hanging out in this hairpin structure. The reason it's called a hairpin is because when you look at these under an electron microscope, usually those loops where the U's I draw are, are bigger loops than that. So you get some hydrogen bonding in between. It kind of looks like one of those things that you used to stick in your hair to hold your hair up. I don't know. Do they still use those things? Hairpin? Yeah? Okay. Does anybody have one right now? I've got a paper clip that wouldn't work. Okay. So that's a hairpin. RNA molecules do this, and we'll see how hairpins are important in genetics later in the semester. So answer to that last question was yes, RNA can base pair with other molecules. All right. Let's talk briefly about Chargaff's rule. Let me add something to the screen here. Please. Pardon? So we'll get into that probably more next class, how the hydrogens bond with one nucleotide to the other in between the two strands of so DNA. That indeed. Ah, so, ha yeah, good question. And by the way, by the end of class today, regardless of whether or not we actually have time to do it, I'm going to ask you to form small groups, two to three students. And each group is going to work on creating a shared Google document and write down all of the vocabulary items that we've talked about so far, which ones you think need to be defined, and then work on group definitions of those. So we'll talk about that in a second, but this is a great example. So what, for example, is the relationship between a nitrogenous base and a nucleotide? So I'm actually going to leave that question open. But please ask again next class if you don't get a satisfactory answer through your colleagues, your peers. The suspense. That's not the point, suspense, but I appreciate that. So in the video you watched for today, you should have seen this table. Data from Shargaff, who looked at the amount of DNA nucleotides present in the genomes of not necessarily all of these species, but some of them. What is, let's do a group definition right now. What is Shargaff's rule? Who can describe the basic components of Shargaff's rule? Yeah. Is it, is it, that's the, the one where it's uh, one gene, one protein, right? What's, so one gene, one protein. That's a different rule, but that's an important one. Uh, Sir? There's always going to be the 
same number to the T's as A's and the same number as G's to C's? The same number of A's as T's and G's as C's. So is that true in this table? Now we're looking at fractions or percentages now. We're not looking at the actual numbers of A's, T's, G's, and C's. Right, is there any organism where that's true in this table? Which one? Mycobacterium. Mycobacterium tuberculosis here. The, number, the percentage of A's matches the percentage of T's, and the same is true for G's and C's. How do you feel about these numbers? Good, bad, indifferent? They're just numbers projected on the screen. Yeah. Everything maps 100%. Should it? Does it? That was one of the questions I asked in the video. I'm not sure. I didn't go back and check. Did they all add up to 100%? Yeah. Brief yeah. check suggests that that's true. OK. That's good. That means there are no weird nucleotides in the genomes of any of these organisms. So they all add up to 100%. Now is your time. Remember, the first day of class, I said one of the important things to realize about genetics, science, and life in general, in my opinion, is that there's not always one clean, correct answer. So you can be creative when you try to come up with explanations for when data don't match what you expect. So let's focus just really briefly on E. coli. Why does the percent A not equal the percent T? <coughs> Why is it 26% A and 24% T? Why isn't it equal? Chargaff's rule says the, the percentage of A's should equal the percentage of T's. So why wouldn't... Uh, I was thinking about that too. So what's your point? No, I was thinking about those two. Like, you have the DNA, as he said, and that's going to code in the mRNA as the co final codon, which would be like... And then you don't want the last part to be because it's already a final codon. Hmm. So, so I'm not sure. The one <coughs> good thing that's coming out of this, there are more than one good thing, but one thing I'm hearing is maybe there's contamination of these DNA samples. Back in Chargaff's day, he grinds up a bunch of mice and extracts their DNA. And maybe some of his hair fell in. Would that affect the yeah. outcome? But our DNA, technically what? Yes. But what if it's a different organism, like a fungus? So what? Yep. Every organism should follow Shargaff's rule, except for which exception? There's what, so I'll leave this for you to think about for next class. What organisms, what set of organisms don't agree with Shargaff's rule? Most of us do. Humans and all of these. Viruses. OK, so let's get down to really plain speak. Why does Shargaff's rule work? Why does the number of A's always equal the number of T's in a genome? They're base paired, they're complementary. They would not be a double strand. They wouldn't be. I would think it's the way to protect the DNA itself. So if you have a loose strand of excess uh, nucleus attaching, that both will have potential to be damaged in some way. OK, so DNA is double stranded for a reason. And there's a reason that RNA is single stranded. I'm kind of anthropomorphizing a little bit because biology knows no reason. There is no brain that controls biology. but. DNA is more stable because the two strands are hydrogen bonded to each other. They're less, DNA is less fragile than RNA. So I need a volunteer to do something that's so easy, I'm not even going to volunteer points for it. Yes, please tell me 10 nucleotides, slowly so that I can write them down. One. Just single letters. Yeah, make up, a, oh, okay. make up 10 nucleotides. Okay. Uh, a, T, C, RNA or mRNA? I mean, uh, RNA. DNA. DNA, you're good. OK, that's 10. So why does Chargaff's rule work? Base pairing. 
every time there's an A on one strand, what's on the other strand? OK, so how many T's do we have now on the, in the whole molecule? Six. OK, now we base pair the t's. Every time there's a t, there's an a. So now how many a's are there? OK, so hopefully, and if that doesn't convince you, do this yourself. I'm not going to come to your house and say, hey, make up 10 nucleotides for me. You have to do this for yourself. But that's why this rule works. Every time there's an a on one strand, there's a t on the other, the number of a's and t's are always, I guarantee it, equal. So, why don't these numbers look like they're equal? Mutation. So it could be mutation. If you're looking at a DNA strand that on one strand is A, T, G, C, and there happens to be a point mutation, that is a single nucleotide has changed from a T to an A, that throws off this rule. Absolutely. Yeah. Human error. Ooh, what sort of human human error or human hair? Error. Okay. Like just you know, when you're in a lab, there's always human Yeah, absolutely. There are no perfect data. What's a really simple explanation for why these numbers aren't equal? Could it be they're like in the middle of creating like copying DNA so they didn't get a chance to Absolutely. So if cell, some of the cells in the organism might be currently replicating their DNA, and so not every molecule of DNA is entirely double-stranded. So you don't have that perfect one-to-one -one correlation. Maybe they just didn't count it correctly. Didn't count correctly? This is an experiment. Yeah. I, because I don't test on dates, I don't remember when Chargaff did this experiment. It was a long time ago. And I, like I said, maybe crushing up rat tails or something. And how would he determine super accurately how many A's, T's, G's, and C's there were in the DNA? You extract the DNA, and then you do some chemical reactions to get some experimental idea of how many A's and T's. But he wasn't actually counting each one individually. We can't even do that today. DNA is too small a molecule. Even simpler than that, one last, one last idea. Why is it 26% and 24% here for E. coli, do you think? Could possibly. How is the DNA stored in the organism? Does that affect well, Chargaff's rule? Well, from our text, uh, bacteria don't actually have a, have a tradition double helix such as we do. I mean, they do, but it's a bit more less than a normal cell. So yes. Maybe, those, maybe the way for it to copy it would have to leave some way for, for the enzyme to get in. That's true, but that rationale I don't think gets at Chargaff's rule, because, only because bacterial genomes are still double-stranded mm -hmm. and base paired with each other. You know, you'd still measure, if your technique was perfect, and that's again where this human error idea comes in. So I'm going to jump in and do the, my answer. What sort of numbers are these? They're whole numbers, and they're percentages. You rarely get whole number percentages in biology. So what happened? They rounded. And when you round, Sometimes you round one number up, one number down, and then they're no longer equal. So maybe this really is 25%, 25% here, but for some experimental errors plus rounding on top of that made them seem like they're different numbers when there's really no difference there. That's not necessarily true, but that might be the case. Okay, so in our last 10 minutes, I want to spend just a couple minutes giving you time to form groups. So in the next three minutes, I want you to form groups of either, I lied earlier, three students or four students. No more, no less. At least three, no more than four. No rounding is involved. Three or four. And before you go, share your email addresses with each other. So every group member has every other group member's Fresno State mail.fresnostate.edu address. Okay? Three minutes.
feedback structure, whether it's the purine or pyrimidine? Did you hear that in the back? OK, so what this gentleman up front just said was that the nitrogenous base is the part of the molecule that is, gives it its identity, the A, the T, the G, or the C, not including the sugar, the phosphate, the oxygen, the phosphodiester backbone. So the base is the rest of the molecule of the nucleotide. Yes? So the nucleotide would include? The nucleotide includes ribose and the nitrogenous base. Yep. Good. OK, one more question, and then we'll finish up. Please. Yeah. So the assignment that you just posted, is that something that we're doing individually? OK, so the assignment that I just posted, by the way, since we're almost out of time, but I'm going to conclude with something else. So we're going to do what to do for next time, one more thing after that. There are two videos. These are their titles. They're on our YouTube channel, so watch. They're short. Watch them. Chromosome representations and nucleotides and polarity. And then, ignore this top one. I decided not to send that out because we've already talked about DNA structures and so forth. But yes, the Google Classroom exercise I just sent out, creating a sequence using Shargap's rule, that should be done by Tuesday night, as it says up here. This is short. It shouldn't take you very long at all. And then here's that last point that I just explained. So one of your group members creates a Google Doc, shares it with all of your group members and me so that I can see what you're up to. There's my email address. And then if you need help creating and sharing a Google Doc, come see me, especially ask the Discovery Hub, ask somebody else in class who's already figured out how to do it. And next time, we'll work on that. Now, we still have two minutes, so I want to quickly go through. No, I'm serious. This is, this is how this works. I want to show you a couple of the screenshots that you sent me when I asked for visual representations of DNA. What's this? Uh, yeah, the first ever picture of DNA. It's an x-ray micrograph, but still, that's a visual representation of DNA. Let's take a look at what else we've got. Don't worry, this won't take very long. Here we go, structure of DNA, a cartoon. And I'm just showing a few examples that I pulled out of all I did. Look at everybody's submission. Two more. And then I'm going to make my, uh, maybe just one more. Then I'm going to make a, an important point, I think. Of course it's important. I made it. Here's one. This is critical for next class. I'm very glad for the person, maybe more than one of you, chose this image. This is a critical cartoon of the relationship between a double helix and a chromosome. But we're going to, over the next couple of classes, learn more about the structure of DNA and how the double helix relates to the X-shaped thing we call chromosomes. There's an important problem with this picture. And I want you to try to figure out what's wrong with the way that this is drawn. Well, we're going to figure it out. So come talk to me afterwards if you want feedback now. But the thing, last point, very last point, I assure you. The thing that was really surprising to me was that nobody actually sent me a picture of a chromosome. They were all drawings, except for that x-ray micrograph, Rosalind Franklin. Everything else was a drawing, a cartoon, a sketch, a diagram. What happened to the pictures of chromosomes? The actual photographs of chromosomes? I got returned in just for class, but there's a picture. Okay, I missed it. So that's a little preview of what we're going to be heading into is the relationship between what we draw as a chromosome and what chromosomes actually look like. See you next class.